what I want to do is talk to you about my experience. And that NPV stands for nuclear polyhedrovirus, which is a unique virus, uh, a, a group of viruses that uh, there are some advantages to these what we call biopesticides, you know, for that guy that's got the burning on his with lambda when he puts lambda out and it burns him. You know, this stuff doesn't do that. <clears throat> these viruses are, are much less harm, harmful to non-target, off-target, uh, to the environment in general. They don't have any impact on other insects. So like this fall armyworm virus, it kills fall armyworms. That's it. It doesn't kill any other worms. It doesn't kill any other insects. It's very, very specific for what it does, which is nice unless you got multiple species out there, uh, then it can be problematic. But we're working with the company right now so they can mix in different viruses and make a mixture. So if I'm in a soybean field and I got loopers and earworms out there, they got a mixture. And you can put it out and it'll get both species. But these are very effective in very, very small quantities, which helps on price and that kind of thing. And, and when I say cheaper than a diamide, I mean a lot cheaper. I'm talking about, you know, in soybeans, if I spray Prevathon or Besiege, I'm looking at $18 to $22 an acre. With, with the mowworm virus that I got, it's $3.50. So obviously it has captured the attention of the row crop people to the extent because of that cheaper price and the effectiveness of it that we've had experience with, it makes it a whole lot better and an easier, easier route. And it's very, very persistent in, in the environment. That's one of the things that we like about it. I think biopesticides are the wave of the future. And I think we're going to be relying on these kind of products in the future because it's getting harder and harder to get EPA to sign off on anything new, as y'all well know, the issues that we got. So we're looking for alternatives to pesticides that will work better with the environment. Some of the disadvantages of, of these biopesticides like the viruses, like I said, there's a high degree of specificity. They only kill that one worm, okay? Uh, the other thing is that we found in our initial work with the row crop people over in the Delta is, you know, this is a living organism. It's not a synthetic insecticide. And so you can't take a jug of it and throw it in the back of the truck and leave it there for two or three weeks. It's going to break down on you. And that, if, you get, if we get into this virus down here, using this virus in, in, uh, for, for pastures, you're going to have to keep that in mind that this thing, it's a living organism, and you got to treat it like, like you would a living organism. You can't throw it out in the back of the truck or leave it out in the sunshine, it breaks down, okay? So that's one of the pro problems with it, the storage and the handling. It's best kept in a, in a, in a refrigerator environment until you use it. That keeps that virus alive for you. And, and in the Delta, all the distributors over there, the Helenas, Jimmy Sanders, all those places, they got a, a freezer set aside or a cooler set aside to keep that virus in when you come in and pick it up and take it to the, to the airstrip or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it can sit outside. It's not like it's going to break down that quick, but you just need to use it after you get it out of the cooler pretty quickly. So there's some, it requires a little knowledge uh, and you gotta know what the application rates and the timing of this product is gonna be a little different than what you're accustomed to uh, in the future. They're not ever gonna be considered a total replacement for regular pesticides. They fit a certain situation and when you use it, and you get it out there on time, it's like magic. If you use it right, it's gonna be good. This is the product that we've been working with the last five or six years with the company Ag Biotech. 
It's called Heligen, and like I, I mentioned, uh, it works on corn earworms and tobacco budworms. It's a liquid formulation. And if you look at that number, that's uh, that 2.22 times 10 to the 11th occlusion bodies per ounce. So do the math, that's uh, like way over 2 billion virions in a little bit of material. So there's a lot of act, there's a lot of virus. You know how small viruses are. So there's a lot of virus in just a little bit of, of material. And that cost, like I mentioned earlier, this is what's getting the growers attention in, in, the, in the Delta. That $3.50 an acre compared to a $15, $20, $25 application of an insecticide can make a lot of difference to them. So we studied this virus and we figured out how to use it and it's going to apply the rules that we have here for the Helogen are going to be exactly the same I think for Fologen, the fall armyworm virus, but you notice that it, you know, we got to spray it early. Uh, we got to keep it out of direct sunlight and store it temperatures around 77 degrees, about like that. And if you do that, you'll have a lot of success. One of the things that, that we see too is you don't spray it and go out three days after application and look and see what you got. It's a virus, it's a sickness, it's a, it's a disease. And so it takes time to run through that population it's, they got to ingest it, they got to do it, it's got to run through, it's just like when you get a cold, there's an incubation period, right? Same thing. So this is the product that we're talking about, it's called Fologen, and that's fall armyworm. And again, it's, it's produced by the same company that makes the Helogen, and there's the concentration in occlusion bodies. So about seven billion, seven and a half billion virions in a milliliter of material. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. The rate is going to be about a half to two ounces per acre. Not very much. Doesn't take very much. And then the cost is about three dollars and fifty cents. And this is, we studied this product about three years ago. And I don't know if you can see the, the untreated check right here but you can see the difference in the treatments. And if you look down here, all those little black spots, that's dead vi that's virus dead caterpillars in the spot. And this is one that's in the process of dying. So it, even when they get a dose, they quit feeding. So when I tell you it takes five, six, seven days for them to die, in the meantime, they're just sitting there laying there with a big belly ache. And they don't feel good and they ain't eating. They don't like it. So, so you can see what that virus looks like. Here's a, that's a really good one right there. This is kind of what you want to see. And you say, well, okay, that's great. That's a dead worm. So what? Well, every one of those dead worms is a virus factory. So it's making more virus and it's incorporating it into your pasture. And so when you get that next generation behind it, that virus is already there working for you. It's already there, it's in the thatch. And so when you get the next flight, the next flurry of worms, you already got virus out there working for you. And what we've seen this year with Helogen, with the product on soybeans, 45 days, 45 days after application, we're still seeing virus dead worms in that field. So that's good, that's what we're looking for. That's the kind of, that's the kind of action that you want where you can spray and hopefully not have to spray again. How does this thing spread? Uh, there's a lot of ways that it spreads. The environment, you know, the obviously, Rain, splashing rain, splashes those virions up on the, on the leaf of the grass. We also see what what's, was interesting to us in our studies with this thing. I had a graduate student that uh, was working on his master's degree and he was working with this virus. And we were trying to figure out in a soybean field, I put it on one side of a 
soybean field and seven days later I got it on the other side of the field. How did it get over there that quick? And that was kind of the purpose of our work that we did trying to figure out how this thing is moving like it is but we're finding the larvae eat the caterpillars when they die so if you have virus dead caterpillars out there and a, another larvae eats on that caterpillar it kills it that way. There's also some parasitoids that can carry it if it stings one caterpillar and it's got the virus when it gets another one it'll get it too. We saw stink bugs that were feeding on them on these virus dying caterpillars and they carry it and that's kind of how it moves but this is the way you know it's just a typical like an insecticide application you spray it with your sprayer and this is what those virus particles look like well, they're called polyhedrons because they're several facets to them. Okay, so this is what those virions look like. This is the, what we call the occlusion body that I, I mentioned a minute ago. And you can see the shape of that virus and inside each one of these polyhedrons are these vir, vir, the, the virion. That's the virulent part of the product that, that, the, that the insect uh, takes in when it eats. And so it inject, this is ingestion only, it's not a contact material, but when they ingest it in, it gets into their midgut, and their midgut is basic enough that it causes that virus to start breaking down that protein matrix, and it releases the virions into the inside of the caterpillar, and then they start doing their action and killing that worm slowly. But this is kind of the life cycle of that NPV and how it works. It just builds up more viruses. So every caterpillar that dies with this virus is a, is a virus factory. It's just making more and more virus. And this is what those larvae look like. When you see them in the field, it's kind of hard to miss them. And you see all that smear up there on that leaf, that's virus. And if another caterpillar comes along and feeds on it, it's going to die. This is the way we saw this thing spread for us in the field. I, we sprayed this small area right here. And you're looking at, at, there's the number of larvae per 25 sweeps. And this is seven days after application when I sprayed it just here. I just sprayed it in this little square. And by by seven days, it's traveled over 200 feet into the field on its own by those other insects feeding on it, whatnot. But it spreads across the field. So in a lot of cases, if you catch them early and you strip your field rather than having to spray the whole thing, you know that it's going to fill in. So that's another savings for you too. And that's the way it spreads throughout the field. But here's some of the insects that we saw that were transmitting this virus. We actually identified 14 new families of insects that actually transmit this virus, that carry it around and help it spread throughout the field. But you can see the insects that are feeding on it, stink bugs, other worms, lacewing larvae, wasp even carry this thing acro across the field. So there's a lot of ways that it gets spread across that field and gets that virus infection going throughout the location where you spray it. There's a lady beetle feeding on them. But those are, that's how that virus gets spread out so quickly. But here's the success, what it takes to be successful with this virus and, and this is the things that you can't ignore. You know, we're targeting small worms, first third instar, that's that uh, quarter inch size worm so you got to catch them early okay you got to catch them early before they get big and start causing damage so that's the big thing but it takes about four and a half to six days to kill the worms but it'll reduce defoliation because like I said they get a stomach ache and they can't eat after a short amount of time and we got we get regularly second generation control if we get a reinfestation, and that's what we're looking for. So we're working with the company at this time. I don't like the virulence that we got with the current product, and so we're screening isolates with the company right now and trying to find some more uh, 
more active virus right now. That's where we're at. Uh, they got a product. It's available for, for sale. But I'm not really satisfied with, with the control that I'm getting in my plots with it right yet. But I think we're going to get there. Uh, we'll be screening a bunch of isolates next year. Okay? But it's coming. I promise you. We're going to get this virus out here to you. And we're going to make it available. And we're going to try to save y'all some money on dealing with these fall army worms in the future. Okay? If you see the moth flap, is that too early to spray that? Repeat that, guys. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, if I see a moth flight, should I go ahead and spray? I'm kind of an IPM kind of guy. I don't like spraying until I got some worms in the field. Uh, we know that the virus will survive about 21 days after you spray it, and you could possibly do okay with spraying on a moth flight, but I'd prefer that we got some small worms in there just to make sure that I get it in their presence. Because this thing is, is broken down by a couple of things. Heat, obviously, because we want to keep it refrigerated. The second thing is it breaks down in sunlight. So it's photo labile. So you want to, the longer it sits out there in the direct sunshine, the quicker it's going to break down. So I think the rule applies, like we said, it's a living organism. Let's use it to the best of its ability. And I think that means when you got some worms in the field, but you just got to catch them small. So the question is, what, what is the survival, you know, in the middle of the summer when the sun's shining and, you know, it's hot? We know that it, it's going to, it takes more than just a little bit of heat and sunshine to break it down. But you, that, the process is, I get it out there in their presence, I get that virus started, and I'm generating new virus. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, this isn't like systemic or or residual control, it's, it's not the same process. It's, I'm making my own virus. So you get it started in that population, so you're creating new virus, and it gets down in that thatch, out of that direct sunshine, and you get a rain and it splashes it up on the leaves, it's gonna stay out there. But you can't think of it as residual control, it's more I get it started in my field. I got my own virus factory going now, and I'm making new virus. That's how you're going to keep it going 25, 30, 45 days. That's how it works. Will it be ready by next year? Because I'm going to have green army worms. I've had them the last Yeah, I'm looking for volunteers that are looking for, that got army worms so I can screen some isolate. So the question is, is it going to be ready for next? Well, it's, it's available now. You can buy it, but I still feel like we got some work to do to improve the isolate that we have to, to keep the virulence up on this fall army worm, this grass strain that we're dealing with. And so, yeah, it's going to be available next year, but how good it's going to be, I can't, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm going to keep working on it, and we're going, to get it, we're going to get it ironed out where we got a product that y'all are going to be satisfied with. Hey, hey, good. The question is, is it labeled for pastures now? And the answer is yes, it is. It's labeled for most crops. Hey, there's a question from uh, um, Polk County. Is there any idea if the virus is able to stay in the environment from year to year? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's some naturally occurring virus that, that we have out there now. And... You know, we get like looper virus this year. We had a big crash in our soybean fields, naturally occurring looper virus that came in and took out our looper population. So, yeah, that's one of the advantages of NPVs. It's possible that this thing could last for over a year, certainly. Y'all are trying to implement something else where it's not just strictly army worms, that it might can kill other... So the question is, are, are we trying to implement other viruses? Yes. There's, there's some products that are coming online that are mixtures of looper virus and earworm virus. Uh, 
there's some other products, that, there's another virus out there called Autographa that has a wider range on LEPs. It just works on LEPs, on caterpillars. But there's some other products out there that may extend that range out, and we're currently evaluating those products, yes. Uh, just a second. There's a question from Pulaski County and also from Union County. They want to know if this virus will have any impact on honeybees or butterflies. Okay, so the question is, does this product <laughs> have any activity? No, that's what I told you early on. It's very, very specific for what it controls. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna make any impact on honeybees or stink bugs or, or anything else. That's kind of the beauty of these viruses is they're very specific and, they're, and this group is only active on caterpillars. Another question from Columbia County, will this virus have any effect on cattle that may be eating it uh, after it's been sprayed? Will it affect them? No, not at all. I mean, it's very safe. This is, it has, has no impact on us. It has no impact on any mammal. Uh, they can eat it all they want and they'll never know the difference. Another question from Sevier County, how should you clean your tank uh, before you use a virus? What steps should you use to clean the tank? That's a good point. The question is, what about tank mixing and that kind of stuff? You know, because a lot of those guys over in the Delta, they like to stick a fungicide in there with it or something like that. No problems. We haven't seen any problems with tank mixing this product. The one thing that you need to know before you spray virus is what is the pH of my water. And if you have a pH near eight, eight or above, then you need to consider a buffering agent in there in the water before you put the virus in. It starts breaking down at pH eight. So that's, that's a very critical thing and that's that's what happens when it gets in the mid-gut of that caterpillar when it ingests it. That alkaline pH in that mid-gut of the caterpillar is what breaks that protein down to get to the virions. So, what about, what about the uh, your water that has some acidic waters that have chlorine and that stuff in there? Does it have any effect on that virus? So the question is: Is there any other? any other issues with water like chlorine or anything like that, not to our knowledge, no. It's all about pH, that's the only thing we need to really be concerned about. Yes? What about adjuvants? So the question is, uh, what about, should I use an adjuvant or what will, so adjuvants aren't going to help you with the virus as long as you're getting a semi-decent application. And as a rule for me, and I've tested adjuvants all my career, and I haven't seen any advantage to using adjuvants, you know, particularly with viruses. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, just on general principles. How long do you need to have before a rain? Yeah, do you need to let it dry so long before a rain or how long do you apply? Yeah, it's, okay, so the question is rain fastness, and I mean, again, this isn't a pesticide, it's a living organism. So if I put it out and I got a big rain and it washed all those virus particles off the plant, that probably wouldn't be a good deal. I probably want to leave it out there as, as long as I can, 24 or 48 hours, to allow that caterpillar to ingest that virus. Because it's got to ingest it. It's not a contact material at all, not at all. So it's, they got to ingest it. So if it's up on that leaf where it's been sprayed and the caterpillar eats it, then they're going to get an infection, right? So it's kind of, in that, in that case, I mean, I wouldn't want a beaten down rain to wash all the vir virus particles off the plant after I sprayed. Have you had any instances where you applied this and you did not get any control or what you wanted? So the question is, have I put this out and not got what I want to, yes, that's the reason I'm screening more isolates right now. I'm not satisfied with the level of control that I'm getting at this point. And that's why we're working on it and screening more virus uh, isolates to see which one's going to give you the best level of control. With the natural viruses that are out there, did they 
that be building up a, re uh, a resistance to some of these viruses that they're being come up with? Okay, so the question is, is there a chance of getting resistance with these viruses? And I ne when it comes to resistance, I never say never. I'm not going to do that, but that's very unlikely. I would say that it, the, the chances of getting virus resistance is pretty, I mean, it, there's been a lot of studies done on that, and they haven't been able to show any kind of resistance issues with viruses. Are they working any down south where the, where the wintertime where they're at as far as trying to control to keep less than 'em up? Oh yeah, the question is are they doing anything down south to control that that's why they come up here already resistant to like pyrethroids and other products is because they've been hammering them down south trying to knock them out of their crops down in the in the in the south in the in the Caribbean, Mexico, the Rio Grande Valley, they hammer hammer with insecticides trying to knock the numbers down for them. And that's why we got resistance issues popping up all the time with our synthetic insecticides. I'm telling y'all, pyrethroids, you know, if you look at that data that that Kelly showed a little bit ago, I wasn't satisfied with what I saw with Lambda, straight Lambda. I didn't get I didn't get the best control that I the level that I'd want to see. And I think, you know, there's there's a those products are they're they're using them a lot down south before we ever get them up here. So the more we hammer down there the less likely we are to do a good job with them up here and that I, that's generally the trend for corn earworms and loopers and all those other issues caterpillar type pests that we have uh, you know they get exposed to a lot of the insecticides down there before they ever get to us if you think about how many times those worms have been sprayed before we ever see them it's a bunch and, and got, always a I'm going to get one more question. I'm going to hand the mic off to Jason over here. He's loading up his presentation. The question is from Perry County, in the future, uh, uh, in the future, another virus enters the market. Is there a possibility of a mutation within that virus? Is there a possibility that this virus can mutate? Well, I, no, I, no, no, I, I think, no. I'm just saying, don't, no, the answer's not. I'm just doing the question, man. Don't I got you. I got you.